right, so hello everybody. Thank you for coming to our Lunch and Learn with Dr. Hudson today. I feel like most everybody has heard of Dr. Hudson, um, very well-known naturopathic doctor. Uh, she graduated from NUNM and has served at NUNM in several capacities, including medical director, associate academic dean, and several other um, titles of significance. She's also been in practice for more than 37 years and is the medical director of the clinic A Woman's Time in Portland, Oregon, and co-owner and director of Vitanica, which I'm sure several of us have used in clinic. I just prescribed one of your Vitanica supplements today. All right, which one did you prescribe? Butterbur Extra. Oh yeah, um, I love that one. Great yeah. supplement. Um, Yes, let's see here. Also director for Institute of Women's Health and Integrative Medicine. Um, and there's just so many titles and so many awards. So yeah, you can, you can just let them <laughs> check it out if they want to. Yeah, and your bio has been shared in our club email and we're just so thrilled to have you. So thank you again. All right. And I'll hand it on over. All right, well, let me share my screen here. Uh, hello, everybody, welcome those near and far. Um, I might turn my video off at some point just because it's a bit distracting to me. Uh, so this is the Botanical Medicine Club, did you say? Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, this is the Bastyr California Botanical Medicine Club. Nice. I don't think, uh, I, don't, I don't think we had that club when I was in school, but that was a long time ago. All right, so let's, uh, you know, we, we, I have this top five botanicals in women's health lecture. I have a top 10, uh, and then I have sort of the top 10 botanicals, top 10 nutraceuticals. Uh, so, so this is just a different version of, of, of that. And we had to shrink it down to five so we could get through enough material. And this, uh, so I'll just make my case, you might say, for why I think these are the top five. And by the way, women's health is, the definition of women's health is includes problems that happen only in women. So the obvious contenders there. But it also, the definition also includes problems that happen more often in women. And so now we get into all of these list of primary care issues that are quite uh there's a long list of ones that are more common in women than in men, anxiety, depression, uh, autoimmune diseases of all kinds, uh, fibromyalgia, osteoporosis, uh, and depending on the age group, insomnia might be on the list, cardiovascular disease might be on this. So it's a long list of significant, significant things. And then the third actually arm of the definition of women's health is problems that occur with some difference or some unique characteristic in women and cardiovascular disease is certainly on that list. So let's get started. I do have some um, disclosures. Um, probably the biggest one just being that I'm a, not only just director of research and education of Vitanica, I'm a co-owner of Vitanica, uh, but I'm on several different advisory boards and speakers bureaus and uh, you know, pick my companies carefully uh, to, to ally myself with. So here's the top five I wanna talk about is St. Chase Tree, Black Cohosh, St. John's Wort, Ginger, and Green Tea. But of course we can come up with some other honorable mentions. I actually probably would put, uh, I might put Valerian on that list. I might put uh, uh, I got fenugreek, turmeric, maca. Um, I had another one on my top 10. I can't remember it. Oh, wait, here I have it here at the moment. Cranberry could be on that list, perhaps. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about these five. So let's start with Chase Tree. Uh, not the first in the alphabet, but uh, first on our list. And I'm going to just stop my video here and there. Uh, so uh, what this slide tells us is I just sort of highlight what you might say, where are where is there some research in Chase Tree and women's health? Not that there might be be there might also be some in fact there are historical and traditional uses of chase tree but i kind of generally in these talks focus on the the research overview aspect so we have research in quite a few areas that are 
uh, women only issues. Um, so, and that's the fruit, generally the fruit of the vitex is of the greatest therapeutic interest where all the essential oils are, those iridoid glycosides, the flavonoids. Um, and often you'll see in a standardized extract of uh, chase tree berry, you'll see it standardized to agnoside or acubine or castacin, I think is the third one. Um, so those are just those iridoid glycoside marker compounds that they can identify and standardize the preparation. So I think probably you all know that, that how we think Vitex works is by increasing luteinizing hormone production, which, and maybe mildly inhibiting FSH. And that sort of results in this shift in the ratio of estrogen to progesterone in favor of progesterone, because you are stimulating, hopefully, ovulation. And if you stimulate ovulation, you get the corpus luteum, and that is what produces the progesterone. It's not that the plant has progesterone uh, in it. It's it's by this mechanism of, of stimulating the the ovulation and having a corpus luteum. Um, so it's sort of more of an indirect effect on progesterone levels rather than you might say a direct hormonal effect. Mastalgia or cyclic mastalgia is really, when push comes to shove, I would say that's the strongest area of research uh, for Vitex. Um, and these are five different studies on cyclic mastalgia. And if you take them in total, you would see, wow, this is impressive. You know, 80% of the patients rated the response is really good. Um, all these studies were positive, twice the decrease in intensity of pain after one or two treatment cycles compared to placebo, about 60% treated with chase tree had an improvement. Another one, the improvement in breast pain was greater in the chase tree group, 52% compared to the placebo group. So this is giving chase tree every day. And, and by the way, I'm not a fan of this, give this herb this half the month and that herb that half the month or the seed cycling thing. I And the reason why I'm not is because that is based on a presumption that these are quick acting compounds, you know, that chase tree acts quickly. It doesn't act quickly. Flax seeds don't act quickly. None of those things act quickly. And so, I mean, chase tree, you need, you know, you're lucky if a month, I would say it's your three months is my preferred amount of time to see, is it helping with cyclic nostalgia? Is it helping with dysfunctional uterine bleeding and ovulatory cycles? You need a good three cycles. So chase tree is not the herb that you give when someone's acute bleeding. Don't, don't, don't make that mistake. Uh, that's just, your, that's just a wasted effort on our part. Uh, and we need to give other herbs that will act quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about ginger, kind of really our standout herb for acute menorrhagia, menorrhagia. But cyclic nostalgia is a super strong area. You give it all month long, men right through the menstrual cycle, all the time. Uh, and if you look at just the studies on not, not just breast, cyclic breast pain, which is therefore a PMS symptom, but PMS in general, this uh, you'll see those studies and here is one of them and um, probably the main decent one in Chinese women. And you did see this sort of total PMS diary score decrease from about 29 down to six and a half by the third cycle at the end of the third cycle. So again, that three months kind of a deal. So a higher the number uh, score, the more symptoms they have and the lower the number, the less they have. Um, the premenstrual tension self-rating scale score decreased from 26 down to about 10. So it looks like it really works. This was a 40 milligrams uh, of uh, a standardized extract. Um, it was probably a German product would be my guess. And they gave it every day throughout the cycle. So I think you should feel really positive about cyclic nostalgia. I think we should feel pretty positive about it in PMS. To me, if a PMS formula, like a multi-ingredient formula, does not have chase tree berry in it, I am moving on to a different product. Uh, the, the contenders that I need to have in a PMS formula are, at the very least, chase tree, chase, uh, St. John's wort, uh, B6, 
calcium, and then it can expand from there. Um, here is uh, a couple little older studies. I think these were, yeah, the first one really old. You know, these were women that had secondary amenorrhea for, or they had um, a variety of menstrual disorders, like kind of all comers. Six of them had secondary amenorrhea and those six all developed a regular menstrual cycle. There's a, so why did they have secondary amenorrhea? We did not know. Um, but at least it looks like it, it did stimulate ovulatory cycles. And then in the second study, this was just 20 patients with secondary amenorrhea, six months of using a nice little old fashioned uh, liquid extract, 40 drops a day. Uh, at the end of six months, they only had data on 15 of the 20, but there was an onset of menstrual cycles in about 10 out of those, in 10 out of those 15. And indeed, they show this increases in LH and progesterone. So it kind of confirms, sorry, I didn't go on to that next slide. Kind of, conf oops, confirms um, uh, what we were, I'll get it together here in a second. It confirms uh, what we were saying initially about the mechanism of action. action. Okay, let's look at this one. There's some evidence that chase tree can suppress prolactin and I do use it in prolactinomas cases um, along with tyrosine, I think is the other thing and B6 that has a little tiny bit of evidence. Uh, so these were women that had luteal phase defects uh, due to elevated uh, prolactin levels. And we do see some, again, that three months, you need three months, don't move on until you've given a good three months. Um, here was a review on uh, PCOS and Chase Treeberry. To me, it's not uh, a, using Chase Treeberry in PCOS to me is not getting at the core issue. You still have to get at the core issue. You can use Vitex, but you need to get at the two core issues, the, the insulin resistance and the hyperandrogenism. So that's where we need, you know, the myoinositol, inositol, and acetylcysteine, cinnamon, chromium, maybe fenugreek. Um, again, the, uh, the, the hyperandrogenism and insulin resistance is the core. If we get at that core adequately, then she will ovulate. And you know, yes, maybe you could push push it a little bit with chase tree, but but don't just give chase tree. And I would say don't give hormonal balancing. Uh, know that the underpinnings of PCOS, um, but it does seem again to lower prolactin, increase progesterone in this uh, review. Okay, let's move on to and many more things could be said about dosing and indications and contraindications and cautions. Um, and, but I'll let you guys look those things up or you already know them. Um, I consider that up to date, a, a really good source of, of, uh, dosing options. They're, they tend to be very conservative. So they tend to have a kind of a laundry list. I mean, they tend to be very conservative in, in about, uh, pregnancy and, and breastfeeding, but it, it's still a really good overview of the research and point you in the right direction. So what about black cohosh and a research overview? I would say the research is strongest by far in the perimenopause menopause department. Um, and, and that's true compared to any other herb. I mean, there's over a hundred maybe 120 by now studies published on black cohosh and perimenopausal and menopausal women. They're not all randomized controlled trials by any means. But you know, what's the next second or what's the next herb that has you know the the most research on on menopause symptoms is probably red clover. I think that's about six, seven to nine. And that one doesn't fare so well. <laughs> Uh, and, um, uh, and then, well, maca has, a, has about that many as well, but you know, like 120 down to, we're talking kind of a half a dozen area is a huge difference. Um, some arthritis issues there, I'll show you a study on PCOS and, and uterine fibroids. Okay. So this is, 
uh, just a sampling of a decent study on black co-wash and treating hot flashes. This was in postmenopausal women. Uh, they were given a black cohosh tablet that was a very tiny dose. I think this was out of Iran. It was a surprising tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Um, so usually I like to see, usually the most of the research on black cohosh and menopause symptoms is like the 40 milligram standardized extract, I think is, is uh, the standout dose for me. So this was different than that, but nonetheless, uh, but the, even with this low dose, there was a considerable decline in vasomotor symptoms. That's the hot flashes and night sweats in the severity and the number of hot flashes after four weeks and eight weeks in particular. Um, and with black cohosh for this group of women in hot flashes and night sweats, I give it four weeks. If it has done nothing by four weeks, I'm moving on to something else. If it has done something at four weeks, we might get a little more of a bump at eight weeks. But after that, you will get, I, I think that's kind of the plateau. Uh, and if I, I didn't show you this part of the slide, I guess. But um, so pre-treatment, they, the, they kind of rated the severity to four. At four weeks, it went down to 1.8. And at eight weeks, it went down to 0.76. So, and the number of hot flashes went from 5.9 down to 2.95 down to 1.07. So that's sort of just as partly where I get that notion of if they have some improvement at four weeks, they'll get a little bit more at eight weeks. This is just a study to tell you that uh, although this wasn't a study to prove safety, it was, it did meet the muster of the IRB board. So it was breast cancer patients who were on tamoxifen, which can uh, have hot flashes and night sweats as a side effect. Um, and the total menopause rating scale score for women on the black cohosh reduced from 17.6 to 13.6. That's not a big jump, but it's, it is statistically significant. Uh, hot flashes, sweating, sleep problems, anxiety improved. The vaginal dryness and the body aches and pains did not change. So uh, although we don't have time today to go into it, but black cohosh is, in my view, the number one herb for a menopausal breast cancer patient who's having menopause symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats. And the reason why I say that, number one, it has the most research. Number two, it has uh, evidence of safety in breast cancer patients. Small evidence, but evidence and safety. Doesn't increase estrogen level, doesn't contain estrogen, doesn't, it's not classified as a phytoestrogen even if you are worried about that and Please don't be worried about soy anyway in breast cancer patients. Um, and, uh, and even in the test tube, black cohosh has been shown to inhibit estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells and add to the anti-estrogen effect of tamoxifen in the test tube of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells. So here's one of three studies showing that when you, if you put black coash and St. John's were together, you might even do better for menopause symptoms. And this was, uh, these were peri and postmenopausal women who had psychological symptoms for at least three months and their average menopause rating scale score decreased from 50% in the treatment group down to about 20% in the placebo group. The depression scale also improved 42% treatment versus 12.7 placebo. In both the general menopause rating scale and that depression scale, the two together was significantly superior to the placebo group. This next one was showing that black co they looked at black coash alone or in combination with St. John's wort, and they saw improvement in both regimens, but the combination was better than black cohosh alone in alleviating mood symptoms of menopausal women. So that is a stellar combination in peri and postmenopausal women who have mood disorder associated with their perimenopause, menopause. And here's the third one, another combo. This was uh, in peri and postmenopausal women and Korean women. They used a different menopause score called the Cooperman index. 
uh, the average decrease was 20 points in the treatment group, only eight points in the placebo group. Now, not surprising, but vaginal dryness and low libido did not improve. I wouldn't expect them to improve with these two herbs. Uh, and the average hot flash scores were significantly lower in this combination group compared to placebo. So let's move on to another topic is PCOS. So the way to use, uh, according to this study, the way to use black cohosh is use it for 10 days out of the month. So we don't always know um, you know, a PCOS patient is like is likely not having a regular cycle, but the idea here is to give it on day two. You start on day two, and then you give it for ten days. So you're giving it in the follicular phase to stimulate ovulation. So this is the one uh, a bit surprise, I'd say, in terms of using herbs. To, with that goal, with that short acting uh, result of, oh, you use it this time in the cycle and boom, it helps with ovulation. Um, and um, they also had greater progesterone levels in the, with this black cohosh. Um, and it was comparable to the Clomid, but even, uh, let me see, had even a let me have even a slightly bit better results in the clobin, which is kind of impressive. Okay, black uh, uterine fibroids. We're I'm always hungry to find any study on natural medicine and uterine fibroids, and we have oh so very few. Really, I think there's maybe two studies now on green tea. There's one on NAC, and there's this one. Um, on black cohosh shrinking fibroids. This was actually originally a menopause study in Chinese women, and they were comparing that 40 milligrams to a drug called Tibolone, which we don't have in the United States at this time. I don't, um, and they had at least one fibroid at the onset of the study. So it looks like the volume change in the black cohosh group was about 30% decrease, which was better than this drug Tibolone, which actually they had an increase in the fibroid. So a 30% decrease in the size of one fibroid, I'll take that any day. Does that mean that it's going to help women with multiple fibroids or large fibroids? It doesn't tell me that, but in the women who really are doubling down on not doing surgery uh, and we want to take a few months, let's try it out. And I would do the black cohosh and the green tea and the N-acetylcysteine. I wouldn't leave it up to just the black cohosh myself. All right, let's move up to on to St. John's work. Of course, the predominant area of research is in depression, generally the mild to moderate depression, but there's even some evidence in severe depression. Um, lots of historical uses as well. This is a Cochrane review from 2006. I should look and see if that's been updated. But at that time, 37 trials. Um, and in the trials restricted to major depression, the combined response rate ratio for St. John's wort compared with placebo with, from six larger trials was not really very impressive, about 1.15 uh, uh, response ratio. But from six smaller trials, it was 2.06. Now, if you take the trials that weren't restricted to the patients with major depression, six larger trials, the response ratio is 1.71. And from five smaller trials, 6.13. Okay, now we're really talking. And in trials that compared the St. John's wort to a standard antidepressant, they were um, equal. St. John's wort equal to the response from the SSRIs or the uh, uh, tricyclics or tetracyclics. I don't think they included the SNRIs. So comparable, having an herb comparable to the effectiveness of a drug is a winner uh, any, any day in my book. St. John's work can also be used for menopause symptoms, not just the depression of menopause. This again was a old fashioned little tincture, 20 drops three times a day. Um, showing, yes, it improves severity of hot flashes. It 
improved the d duration and it improved, uh, I don't know if it improved frequency. Did it improve frequency? Uh, yes, it improved frequency. Um, and um, did they look at anything else in this one? I guess they were just looking at hot flashes in this one. Um, but to me, an ideal perimenopause, menopause patient for St. John's work would be the woman who had hot flashes, night sweats, and some depression. Uh, I think I said earlier, I always like to see St. John's work in a PMS formula. This was a small study. St. John's work uh, was statistically more beneficial than placebo for food cravings, swelling, poor coordination, insomnia, confusion, headaches, crying, and fatigue. Oddly and surprisingly, it was not statistically more beneficial for depression, uh, nor irritability and anxiety, but that, that, surpri that surprised me. Um, now, and they were 900 milligrams a day. That's kind of, that's our kind of robust dosing. So I can't really explain why that one didn't yield better results. All right, let's move on to ginger. Look at all these areas for ginger. Ginger has a nice collection. It's getting a nice library of research. Um, and we've added to it in the last few years in the area of dysmenorrhea, dysmenorrhea menorrhagia and acute migraines. Lots and lots of historical uses, of course, that you guys are probably familiar with. And uh, excuse me, I have to get a little more green tea in me. Um, and probably you all are using it for some, in some of your upper respiratory things or some of your GI issues. Uh, but here's one study on the acute menorrhagia. This is, this is a real winner. 250 milligrams of ginger powder, one capsule, three times a day, or placebo. Um, and the ideal time is starting the day before and go through the third day. So it's a total of four consecutive days. And of course, you would have, she would have to know we would have to know two things. Yes, she's a, someone who has a predictable heavy period and we know that she has a regular period. So we can pretty much identify when this day before is. I mean, if by accident was it two or three days before, that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but the average decrease in heavy menses in the ginger group started that very first cycle. So this is short acting quickly, that anti-inflammatory effect of ginger is why it's working here. You can use this same technique, by the way, with ibuprofen uh, and get similar, maybe, maybe not quite as good results, usually about a 30% decrease in blood flow. This was a, about a 46.6% decrease. But I expect to see the results this month, this period. And then you do it the next period and you do it the next period. Every period, now we haven't corrected the underlying issues, but we're using it uh, as kind of a placeholder um, while we also are maybe helping her with her, maybe it's a luteal phase defect. Like does ginger, the question would be, does, could you rely on ginger to work for a he heavy bleeder submucous fibroid patient? Yeah. <laughs> don't be too optimistic or a polyp, uterine polyp. I, I, it's, it's unlikely, but if it's um, acute menorrhagia to no pathogenic cause, uh, I would say that's my most optimistic scenario for it. And here is just one of the studies uh, that have been done on ginger and dysmenorrhea. I thought I had, let me just see. Yeah, um, so this is just one of them. And the dosing is similar, but not quite the same. 250 milligrams, four times a day. Starting as soon as they start bleeding, you give them this for the purpose of decreasing their functional dysmenorrhea or their, um, you know, not due to a fibroid or endometriosis. This is just that prostaglandin glitch dysmenorrhea. Uh, but it might also, I do use this for endometriosis, uh, dysmenorrhea as well. 
primary dysmenorrhea, but um, but I'm most optimistic for just that someone who doesn't have endometriosis um, or doesn't have a fibroid. So 250 milligrams four times a day. Um, and that's comparable uh, to the ibuprofen 400 milligrams four times a day. And more women in the ginger group became completely pain-free versus the anti-inflammatory. So pretty cool. Here's just a, you can look up the other studies if you want. This was the systematic review uh, on dysmenorrhea and a total, let's see here, uh, a totally, the dose ranges was quite a bit, but they all show efficacy. Very, very nice. There's not, the list for herbal medicine research and acute migraines is, is tiny, tiny, tiny. But this one showed that this one humble little capsule of ginger seemed to work about as well as one do fit low dose of the sumatriptan, which is also called Imitrex, reducing the severity within two hours. So, hey, that's easy to give that a try. Again, though, what's, can we use other lifestyle changes, hands-on therapies, nutraceuticals, botanicals to correct the structural, but more likely uh, inflam mishap that's happening in the brain of a, of a migraine patient. All those inflammatory mechanisms, uh, the HT receptors are hypersensitive, the platelets are sticky, the serotonin is glitchy, uh, the vaso instability, all those mechanisms are involved, which is why I like to give a multi-ingredient formula all month long for likely several months to correct that those some of those underlying mechanisms. So we have research on uh, the ginger and 5-HTP and magnesium. And um, let me see just what else, hold on. Um, riboflavin, that's an important one. And butter burr, that's an important one. And maybe, and maybe fever few. Um, but there, and CoQ10, uh, I usually add a nice, I think the dosing on CoQ10 is 100, it's at least 150 milligrams a day for chronic migraines. It might be more than that. You might want to check it out. Some nice research on nausea and vomiting and pregnancy, five randomized controlled trials. They're all positive. The dosing ranges a little bit. Instance of vomiting even decreased 50% in the ginger group. Nausea intensity improved in 84% of those who use ginger. Uh, so this is a this is a mainstay for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. Let's move on to uh, green tea um, and look at that research overview list. There's quite a few things on that list. Um, and of course, there's a long list of historical uses as well. And if we were looking at other countries more, I'd probably the list would get even longer. So this was just a, a look at, uh, this was a meta-analysis to assess the association between tea consumption and endometrial cancer. Green teas and black teas were included in the search. And that results of that suggested that tea consumption was statistically significantly associated with reduced risk of endometrial cancer. An increase in tea intake of two cups per day was associated with a 25% decreased risk of endometrial cancer. In analysis by subgroup, green tea consumption was the winner, uh, was significantly associated with decreased risk, whereas black tea was not. So here's, here's to green tea. I use green tea vaginally and orally in my cervical dysplasia and HPV protocols. Uh, this is kind of a complicated, messy little study where they had four different groups. Uh, one group applied this poly E ointment, which was EGCG to patients twice a week. Um, and oral delivery was uh, poly E or EGCG. And then uh, what else? Yeah, so two different doses, I think, of a oral. Overall, 
69% uh, response rate was noted for treatment with green tea extracts as compared to 10% response. So um, there is some, I don't have it here, but there is uh, some research on topical green tea ointment for general, external genital warts. You might wanna check that out. It's, you can have it compounded by a compounding pharmacy, 150 milligram green tea ointment. Uh, I believe it's four times a day for 16 weeks. Then the suppositories are twice a week for 16 weeks if they're HPV positive. Uh, but again, and that's 150 milligrams compounded suppository. I have had uh, patients and non-patients but report to me, don't be putting a green tea capsule in women's vaginas. And I would say this is also not an area for homemade suppositories. I've now seen just a few too many contact dermatitis for my comfort. So it, how that green tea is uh, dissolved into the vagina matters. And so the compounding pharmacy, the base that they use allows for that sort of slower dissolution. So I would definitely have it compounded 150 milligrams green tea suppositories twice a week for 16 weeks. And then you can look up, there is a commercial drug called Verigen for genital warts, annoyingly expensive. So you can have that compounded and accomplish the same thing, but look that up. That's for external genital warts. And then we have a little bit of information. This has been around for a long time uh, for stage one and stage two breast cancer patients. Um, that may be drinking five or more cups of green tea a day with an average of eight uh, um, had a, a, about a 24% lower rate of recurrence. That's a heck of a lot of green tea. I mean, you know, I get my one cup, but so I, I when I realistically, I'm not going to probably get my patients to do five, let alone eight cups of green tea a day. Maybe you'll be better at that than me. Um, but stage one and stage two, really not stage three, doesn't seem to work. Um, so you can use green tea capsules, depending on which ones you use. You can kind of figure out some math. Usually one capsule of a nice potent standardized extract is equal to about three cups a day. And the Osaki study uh, just showed us that actually green tea consumption is inversely associated with mortality due to all causes, and, but especially cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's strongest for that in women and strongest for cardiovascular disease in women. Um, not, it didn't show a beneficial effect in terms of overall prevention in, of dying from, of getting breast cancer or dying from breast cancer, or I'm sorry, cancer mortality of any kind. Um, maybe check out I've done a lot of this over the years. I'm not sure how effective it is, if at all, but if, if I'm looking for a little trick to try to stimulate their metabolic rate to help them lose weight, um, green tea, two capsules with breakfast and two with lunch might facilitate a little bit of weight loss. This is a lozenge. I'm gonna skip over this one of green tea and people with dry mouth who had Sjogren's syndrome and there did have an increase in their saliva output. I haven't really poked around um, Ryan, maybe you could poke around. Just is there a such is a is there a commercial green tea lozenge? I'm not sure that there is. I haven't checked. Here's the here is the one I am excited about though. This is, was a uh, green tea, and I sh I'm sorry. I think there is a second study now green tea with vitamin D, and it might even be on my blog, drtoryhudson.com, but showing that all these women had at least one fibroid measuring two centimeters or larger. Uh, the final 20, 22 women in the green tea group, there was a significant fibroid total volume reduction of about 33%, and also a reduction in some of their fibroid specific symptoms of about 33%. So that's very, very cool. Let's see, can we figure out the dosing? I don't think my slide include the dosing. Uh, it, well, it did say how much EGCG, but 45% EGCG, I would say, well, 45% of what? We'd have to go back and look at, was that 45% of 150 milligrams? I'm not sure. I think that's what it was, but but we, but you should go back and look. Um, honorable mentions. Uh, 
valerian, fenugreek, turmeric, maca, cranberry. Those are those are in my top ten. Um, all right, that was the whirlwind tour. Uh, by the way, you would be welcome to attend, which is still a virtual conference now, uh, the Institute of Women's Health. We just had our annual uh, menopause and hormone boot camp, but we have a two-day seminar at the end of July, uh, primary care in women. Um, and you can go to that website and you get, there's a student price. I don't know if the student price is on there. If it's not, then you just call and you register as a student. Uh, but it's a two-day seminar, some fabulous speakers always, and this time is no, no, uh, no exception. Dr. Alan Christensen, he's like the leading naturopath in thyroid disease. Dr. Catherine Darley, I consider her the leading naturopath in sleep disorders. Uh, maybe a teacher you are all familiar with, Dr. Kazra Pernadiali. I think he's a real leader also in cardiovascular disease, and he'll be doing hypertension in particular. So check out the schedule and maybe you'll be able to join us. Uh, Ryan, do you want to see if there's any questions or maybe people have to go off and do something else? Yeah. Um, first, thank you for mentioning the seminar coming up. I didn't know about that. Um, and also just another shout out for your boot camp. I haven't been to it yet, but um, it's highly recommended by some of our clinic supervisors here who specialize in women's health. Um, as one of their go-tos to stay up to date on um, working in women's health. So it's definitely on my um, list of seminars. On your to-do list, today. all right. Yes. Um, and yeah, at this point, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute and ask. And if not, I did look at the green tea lozenges on, uh, we use Emerson at our clinic here, and there's not one on Emerson, but there are some just briefly looking, I don't think they're high quality, but there are some sort of green tea um, lozenges or candies on the market. Um, but it doesn't seem that we have like a good high quality one yet, so. Yeah. Interesting. There's too. probably gummies. There's gummy everything, but that's not the same as a lozenge, right? A gummy you still chew and swallow. A lozenge it stays in there, and mm -hmm. I think uh, that would probably be important in addressing the dry mouth phenomenon. Yeah, it's. Um, I hadn't heard of that before, so it's really yeah. to learn about. Um, All right. If there aren't any questions, then I guess we can wrap up. Um, I want to thank you again so much for doing this lunch and learn for us. Um, we're just so thrilled that we were able to have you. And this was um, such a great presentation. A lot of clinical pearls and things that are going to go into my clinic notebook. All right. Um, yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. All right. Good luck, you all, with your studies and in your future. Okay. Thank you so Take much. Bye-bye. Thank you.